Wednesday. It's hump day. It is the uh, Bob McCowan podcast uh, for you. <laughs> Greetings, salutations from um, Toronto. Uh, John Shannon, as always, with me. And uh, joining us, a uh, an old and longtime friend. Old in the sense, <laughs> well, hold in every sense. Careful. careful. Uh, Keith Kelly <laughs> is now the uh, chief executive and commissioner of the European uh, Golf Tour, and he uh, joins us. Are you at home? I am at home. I am at home. So I don't have, home. I have an office. I have an office, but it's not as, if you're watching this on YouTube, it is not, it doesn't have as much paraphernalia and memorabilia awards. And of course, it has no signs of any vineyard anywhere in my office. <laughs> you're, the only, well, you're the only guy in the UK that would recognize that as a, as a vineyard, so... <laughs> Well, he's been there. He's done that. He's got that T-shirt. Yeah. Uh, How are you, gents? We're all right. How's the family before we get started on the... They're, uh, they're, they're really good. They're real good. Uh, Joan, Joan loves it over here, and Hope and, uh, and Jason are, uh, are growing up quickly, and Jason's going to his last year of, of high school, and wow. he's, he's now looking at, uh, at universities, and I'm trying to get him to go up to St. Andrews, because uh, it's... Ah. Oh, it's well. Not only it's a beautiful town, but a great place to play golf, and he could play in the golf team. But uh, he's uh, he's leaning to come to the U.S. So we're uh, we're having hold solid. On, hold on, hold on. Can, listen, can he beat Dad though? Can he beat Dad on the golf? Yeah, game? yeah. You know, the, the other day, John, you like this story. The other day, we're playing, and I said to him, "Listen, that was that was, that was he just slow down the swing just a bit." And he said, "Dad, it's nine one in our match," <laughs> and I said. Yeah, okay, fine. Yeah, swing, <laughs> swing whatever you like. <laughs> yeah, no, he can, he, he can beat me, well, every time now. It's, yeah, it's, I've been through I that. I still won't take shots, though, John. I won't take shots. No, no. I actually, no. You know what, I, did, I played with my son last week, and he's beat me for about five straight years now, Keith, and I still want to play from the back tees with him. I will not give up, and, and, oh. and I'm – I'm hitting three wood from, <laughs> from the fairway, and he's hitting seven iron. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 of course. I, I, he, I'd rather him close me down on 11 than take shots. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, good, good to see you guys. Uh, great to see you. Uh, let's talk about uh, this uh, pandemic that uh, yeah. we're all sure. going through. And I know uh, it's been bad in uh, Britain for uh, some time. Is it getting any better over there? Well, you know, it's, it's been horrific to say the least. And, and I think Canada has done a remarkable job uh, as, as, we've, as we've watched from a distance. Uh, the, the, the way that I would describe it here in the UK is probably the same way I would describe it any, everywhere else is nobody really seems to have a handle on whether we're going into a second wave, whether whether it's getting better, whether it's getting worse, uh, you know, it, we are we are now over the last week where it seems that it's going the wrong direction. After after yeah, after many positive months, uh, and especially from our perspective, from the golf side, uh, you know, we've been playing inside a restricted bubble for the last. 10 weeks and we were just starting to move out of it. And I think we're now going to go right back into it, which is, uh, which is really disheartening, but it is the reality uh, of, of living in a COVID world. You have to adjust, you have to change and you have to modify your thinking almost every day. And How do you describe your bubble, Keith? Uh, our, our bubble, our bubble is, uh, is incredibly restricted, John. It's only for players, caddies, uh, no, no coaches, no managers, no players. Uh, I mean, no um, uh, spouses or, or significant others. Uh, it is. Uh, it literally is players, caddies, broadcaster staff, and very, very, very limited media. We've, uh, but, but uh, everybody in that bubble is uh, is tested prior to coming to the tournament. Uh, once they come to the tournament, they are. Um, uh, at, at that particular time, they're tested again, and then they're inside the bubble, and they can't leave that bubble. And we had a UK swing where, you know, the only time that you were leaving the bubble was if you were going home after a, a specific tournament. But once you're inside the bubble for that week, you're not allowed to leave it. We had one 
we had one breach where uh, where a player and a caddy went to uh, went to a pub, and uh, and and we disqualified them, and uh, and they understood it was a uh, it was just an error in judgment. And in fact, he came back and won a couple of tournaments a couple of weeks later. So maybe the rest did uh, John Kaplan from the U.S. very very good. Uh, but the reality is, and here's the fundamental difference, John, is when you're an international event dealing with as many countries as we deal with and you're dealing with players from non-exempt countries right the only way the government will allow you to play is to go into a restricted bubble which is also the biggest challenge that we have in the european tour we play in 31 different countries so that means you're dealing with so many different governments and and the the english government is different than the spanish government different than the Portuguese different than South Africa. And there was one day I had four different government calls and it was like, oh my goodness, we were allowed to do that here, but we can't do that here. It's uh it's it's a challenge. It is it is a for for me, I've learned so many different new skills that it, that uh that you have to because you're you're in a completely different world and the job changes overnight. And if you're not prepared to adapt or modify you'll fall behind real quickly and uh it was tough the first three months i'll tell you was the toughest three months i've ever had in 35 years in in television and in sports and uh mm. and it wasn't like i was i was working in sports you know very quickly your most valuable player becomes your chief medical officer right and uh and i'm talking to the chief medical officer every single morning that's the way the day starts at 7.30 and then you go from there. It's incredible. So have you had a positive test? I mean, you talked about the two guys that were sent home because they left the bubble, but did they test positive, Keith? No, they didn't. We've had, we've had one player test positive in, how many events we've had? Two in Austria, six in the UK swing, Spain, Portugal, Portugal, and Ireland. So since we've been back playing, that's 11 events. We've had one positive test so we've had over yeah well we have we have 500 people in the bubble for every so we've had over 5,000 tests we've had one positive test and what happened with uh, that individual that individual went home it was it was Alexander Levy from France he went home he had uh, he had dinner with uh, with a friend at a, at a restaurant once he was outside the bubble mm -hmm. then to come back into the bubble for the next week he tested positive Unfortunately, he had had dinner with another player the night before. Um, and uh, so that player also tested negative, but was disqualified based on the, uh, based on the, the hard restrictions and rules that we, that we have. So um, that's the only positive test. Then we, uh, we, we, put, the, we put Alexander uh, in, a, in a hotel room uh, nice suite, actually, for uh, for three weeks at Celtic Manor in Wales, and then uh, then he went home. Or not quite three weeks, just twelve, fourteen days. Actually. So, 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 you, you, but your your tour, um, how much do you, uh, how much are you concerned about not having fans walk the course? I mean, because how, how much revenue really is that? Because you, well, you're, yeah, you're really I, I a TV, say, you're a TV, you're a TV sport, really, aren't you? Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. In terms of in terms of the consumer revenue for fans and hospitality, uh, fans uh, gives you the atmosphere, which enhances everything. Uh, but in terms of the revenue, uh, that revenue is not detrimental to our business. What right. is is the hospitality and the pro ams on Wednesday. So we've had one pro am. We tried. Uh, Portugal allowed us to try a pro am where we we were every single player. We had forty five uh, people come the night before and get tested uh and then they 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 uh, they came the next day played uh social distance with the players and then left right away so it was um it was pretty good but portugal is the only place we've had a pro-am but pro-ams john are uh, are something that's obviously very key to the game in terms of the partners and sponsors so it's a big revenue hit. so but bob before you go bob i just, just so how would you define i mean we, we hear all about the, the north american sports and where their revenues are how, your revenue is affected greatly not that much 
a smaller percentage than you imagined the, the, w when you say compared to last year? Well, our number, our number one source of revenue is, is, is television and our media rights. And second is, uh, second is sponsorship. Uh, but we've had 30 events canceled or postponed. So, right. you know, those are, those are events like the, the Porsche European Open and, and, uh, uh, you know, an events, you know, the, the, uh, Omega, the Omega event in, uh, uh, in Crown, Switzerland is, is, so all those partners have, have gone away. What I can tell you is that we've had some unbelievable partners that have stayed with us and not only stayed with us and said, okay, here, we're here with you. We're here at this particular time. Rolex has been the best example. Rolex is, is our number one partner and they've been just outstanding in this. Uh, and they said from the beginning, this is going to be difficult. This is going to be tough, but we're here. Uh, we're not going to get the value that we have gotten in previous years, but we're going to give you uh, all, all, all that we, uh, uh, all of the contract that we that we have, and we'll figure things out down the road. And and that is that's an unbelievable uh, relief to us, based on the size of uh, of Rolex and how important they are to the tour. So we have we have lost, like I said, we've had 30 events either canceled or postponed. So it's been it's been really really difficult to say the least. We're with Keith Polly, who's the uh, chief executive of the European Tour. Uh, you're well aware. I don't need to remind you that the United States Open was just concluded. We are a month or so away from the Masters in the fall, not in this usual April date. And uh, I don't know that the audience understands this, but. It is the RNA who controls the British Open and whether they play or do not play. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Yeah. And um, the RNA, um, like everybody else, uh, postponed, canceled the British Open this year uh, yeah. with no, or the Open Championship, uh, with no intent on looking for another date. What's the impact of that been? Well, I, I think it's it's. Um, I think as far as from uh, from European golf, uh, the Open Championship is is just an unbelievable event that that galvanizes whatever country it happens to be in. Last year, Northern Ireland. This year, it was going to be in England, um, and and it also is a great boost for European golf overall. It's a massive boost for us. You know, the Aberdeen Standard Investment Scottish Open precedes the Open Championship, and right. it's arguably one of our biggest events of the of the year. Uh, what the impact was is it changed the entire global schedule, and and what happened was all four of the uh, Augusta, uh, the PGA of America, the RNA, uh, the USGA, the PGA Tour, myself, and the and the LPGA, you know, we were on the phone every week talking about different scenarios, what we were going to do to help each other out, how we were going to schedule it all, uh, because everybody had to juggle the schedules around uh, the majors. And so, you know, the US, the US Open, uh, there was a lot of discussion about whether they were going to be able to play in that particular date. And that date then became available because that date was going to originally be the date of the new Open Championship when they suspended it early in, uh, in, in, in July. So there were a lot of moving parts. So uh, the open, in terms of the open, uh, you know, they, it was, it was great to get the, uh, the ladies op uh, British open uh, played. Uh, the open championship will be back, you know, next year, the year after will, uh, will be the, uh, the, the anniversary at, at the, uh, the old course in St. Andrews. I think it's a, is it 150 years? Uh, I believe. But but it had a big impact. It had a big impact on 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 global golf because obviously now there's only three majors played this year. So uh, I, I'm just you're you're quite confident that things will be okay next year. I mean, when you think about no, where... I, I never I never said that, John. <laughs> I, I, no, I never did. You know, I, I I say that Q1 and Q2, you know, is still going to be incredibly tricky. Right. Like, like we do. John, every single morning from, from the, the conversation with the chief medical officer, we go into the schedule. And it is absolutely dumbfounding that here we are in October 
and we still don't have our schedule done till the end of this year. We still have a scenario where we have three events and three different scenarios that we're working with the government uh, and we will play. But now we've turned our attention to Q1 and Q2 of 2021. And there's already a European country that has said to us that are playing in Q2. And I won't give the country, it was said to us, I don't know if we're gonna be able to do it because I don't think we're gonna be able to have hospitality and fans. And that's in May. Wow. That's in May. So, so if, if, you know, I'm not thinking that we get back to complete normal uh, until Q3, Q4. So, I, so, so when you ask about something as big as the Open Championship, you know, I'm going up to see Martin Slumbers, who's the chief executive of the RNA next week. And that's one of the things that we're chatting about because we're, we're wonderful partners together. And, uh, and the Open is so big here uh, that we want to help as much as we possibly can. But he, 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 who knows whether you're going to be back to normal by that particular time. Right. All right, let's get off the COVID stuff for a bit. Um, I, let's update us a little bit on something. There was uh, plenty okay. of speculation, and I believe discussion, about the possibility of merging the PGA Tour of America with the European Tour in some way, shape, or form. That has gone on, off and on, for a long period of time. You want to tell us where you're at with that? Well, I, I think, you know, you know, the PGA Tour and Jay Monahan is, is, uh, is a very good colleague of mine, and we've gotten much closer during the entire COVID situation because we have shared so many different things, including uh, our respective chief medical officers speaking on a regular basis. And and how we're going through the uh, the pandemic, and how we were going to deal with people that got tested, and 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 all all of that. Uh, you know what we did is say, listen, when we when we get through this, uh, let's start having some some serious conversations and see how we can work closer together. Uh, I think I think golf is uh, is somewhat fractured right now. And that's, that's one of the challenges. You've got the four majors, the PGA Tour, and ourselves. And, and, and I think that creates the wrong double C. That creates consumer confusion as opposed to consumer clarity. And, uh, and, and I think uh, long-term uh, consolidation with inside uh, professional golf would be a positive step, I think. Difficult when you think about the USGA and the RNA, who they they don't get too many days in the sunlight. They 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 get they have their events and they get to enjoy them. And they you know they're they're like volunteers. And the only thing worse than a volunteer is a volunteer with a walkie-talkie. But um, that you it's difficult to take that 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 notoriety away from these these groups. Well, yeah, listen, the, the USGA and the RNA who, who run the Open Championship and the US Open respectively also are the governors of the amateur game. Right. And, and they've got a couple of things on their plate that will bring them to attention over the next couple of years. And that's obviously distance and ball and, and bifurcation, which is becoming a big, a big topic in, in our game. And you know what transpired last week with Bryson DeChambeau will only heat up that conversation. Uh, you know, I, I don't think I can go any day talking to anybody that's involved in our game without them saying, are we going to roll back the ball? Are we, are we, are we changing? You know, we, you, the only thing that I do know is that you can't build 8,500 golf, uh, 8,500 yard golf courses or 9,000 yard golf courses. So, so uh, it's, it's an interesting one. And that is going to bring the RNA and the USGA, I think, closer together. It'll bring us all closer together as we try to figure this out of what we're going to do going down the road. Well, and those obviously those discussions have started to take place. It was my next question, actually, is with DeChambeau hitting at 385 yards off the tee, and I kept thinking, um, you know, this guy would win every long drive contest there is because he can hit it reasonably straight. And, you know, those guys who are in those long drive contests generally yeah. – Getting it. I mean, they can hit it far, but you, they have no idea where it's going. Yeah, yeah. And they get back and, pain just watching them. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we're talking about, you know, listen, two weeks ago, two months ago, a guy who hit it 330, you know, you're wondering, well, is this too far? You know, you're, you're, you're mitigating the, the impact of golf courses. 
Now it's 385. I mean, at, at what point do these golf courses become obsolete? Completely and utterly obsolete. I saw a conversation on the Golf Channel, Keith, just the other day. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, redesigning golf courses to narrow fairways at, at some point and do this, that, and the other thing. And I said, well, you can't do that either. Yeah, because it was pretty narrow at Wingfoot. It sure was. Didn't yeah. seem to bother Bryson, did it? No, because, because well, the, the interesting thing with Bryson is, is uh, he hit it in the rough, but he only had a, a nine or a wedge. Right. And the strength and the power, like if, 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 if we had those lies, I'm telling you, we're still hitting the 60 degrees, opening it up and going sideways. Yeah. But his strength to get through the ball was just unbelievable. And, and it, was a, it, it really was a different game. I think Louis Ustazen said he's playing a different game out there. Well, and, it, but, but have you guys – let me ask you this. Uh, and I, and I, uh, Colin Campbell and I used to talk all the time about how the NHL let the manufacturers run the game. Yeah. Whether it be shoulder pads or hockey sticks or Goalie skates, equipment. Goalie yeah. equipment. Has that, did, did that happen in golf, maybe to a, 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 an even worse extent? Well, I, I, I don't, that's, a, that's an excellent question because the manufacturers are, are all doing what they should be doing is trying to make their product better and sell more product to the consumer. And, and you know, golf, golf relies a lot on those manufacturers. When you look at the likes of, of Callaway and, and TaylorMade and Titleist and Ping, you know, and, uh, you know, and they're all talking about use this, use this, the, the new big Bertha right now over here is the talk about, uh, and you, you can't get one for, uh, for six months. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's an excellent question. There is no doubt that every conversation regarding distance and ball going forward will involve the manufacturers and will involve taking their opinions and their thoughts into account because they're, they're a critical part of our game. All right. So let me, let me give you just a little bit of my analysis of this. And I'm intrigued by, by what you say. You and I may have talked about this in the past, but I, I don't recall what your opinion on it is. I understand this whole club manufacturers, ball manufacturers want to improve their um, equipment. Everybody in every business, whatever they produce, whatever they make, they want to make it better. We all get that. I'm not here to suggest that somehow golf manufacturers should be um, prohibited from doing that. Is there any reason, though, that the clubs that you sell or that are sold to Joe 16 Handicap or you, Keith, or John, or I? Yeah, yeah. Do they have to be the same? as what is sold to the guys on the tour. In other what's words, your, what, yeah, you what's your thought? Yeah, yeah, totally get it. Yeah, what's your thought? I don't see an answer other than limiting the specs on the tour players. That I can hit a ball 265 or 270, um, I'm not going to be affected. Am I going to be affected uh, negatively because Tiger Woods can only hit a 275 or 280 yeah, yeah, yeah. because his equipment is different? And the answer to me is, no, I'm going to enjoy it more. I'm tired of watching guys hit wedges into par fives. Okay, so let me ask you this question, though, okay? Is, is golf is unique in that it's one of the only sports that you can compare yourself directly how good you are mm -hmm. to, to the pro, okay? Sure. So, so I always sit there and I look and I go play Wentworth and Wentworth from the back tees is 7,350 yards and, and they, they, they grow the rough. Uh, it's the West course. The greens are running at 12. It's, it's absolutely a beast. And I, and I played it, you know, and not very often do I play it from the tips, but the odd time I play it from the tips and it's punitive. And, and, and every time, though, when I'm walking down 18, I go, I still can't believe that Alex Norn in the, in the wet shot 62 on this golf course. Yeah. I, I go, how good? And I, and I play with these guys all the time. How good is that in tournament play? So, Bob, the, qu the 
the question is, and you play up at, uh, at, at Goodwood, you play the, the tips from Goodwood and you're a, you're a really good player and you play really, really well and you putt well and you put everything in the hole and you shoot your best round and you play great as good as you can play. And I don't, and I know you're a, a really low handicap, but from the backs, how long it is and how tough it is, maybe you shoot 76 or 77. Yeah. So I okay. couldn't care. I hang couldn't. on, hang on now, now, now. So, so some, uh, so a pro comes and plays his best and shoots 61. Do you not care? Like, does it, does, and it's an interesting question. Do you go, Oh my God, I played as well as I could and shot 77 and no, he beat Keith, me by 15 strokes. Keith, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, I'm going to tell you a little story that answers your question. <laughs> so as you know, the open championship was the week before the Canadian open. So a lot of the guys got on that RBC charter and yeah, yeah. you know on Sunday night after the open and flew to Toronto or wherever, uh, if it was at Glen Abbey. Yep, yep. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So a couple of years ago, and we should tell people that, that Keith was at least briefly a member at Goodwood. So I, I, but I don't think you were a member anymore then. So John Daly comes over. Yeah, sure. And on the Monday morning, he comes to Goodwood. And I go tee it up with him. The first hole is a par five. It's about yeah. 525 yards or something like that. Uh, Daly whips one into the rough on the right, hits a six iron onto the green, and knocks in his putt for eagle. Okay? I hit a driver, a three wood, chipped it on. Next hole is a short par four, about, what, 290, 300 yeah, yards. Yeah, exactly. He hit three wood over the back. Chipped down and made his putt. And you're playing the same key boxes, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The next hole, par five. Are you I'm going gonna... through the whole round? No, I'm going to stop in a minute. Because, <laughs> I, I mean, you're, you're, like, you're like at the no. press conference reading wait, the card. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> there is a big oak tree on the right side of the third hole. Am I lying, Pelly? No, I got it. I know where it is. I've been behind it so many times. So I'm standing on the tee. Daly comes over and he says, Bob. Can you hit it over the oak tree? And I said, well, nobody I've ever seen can hit it over the oak tree. I can barely get it to the oak tree. Daly takes out his driver. Boom! Flies the oak tree. Hits wedge. Driver wedge on a 540-yard par four. Makes his putt. Yeah, yeah. Birdie on the next hole, too. So he's six under after four holes. Yeah, okay. Holly, here's the the essence of the story. Yeah, I didn't need to play with Daly and watch Daly <laughs> dismantle my golf course to know I'm not as good as Daly. <laughs> yeah, I don't okay. need that qualification or clarification. You yeah, know, yeah. and I know, and Shannon knows, we ain't as good as them. Yes, and watching I watching them on television on a course that I'm never going to play, the relevance is lost on me. Okay, but hang on, Bob. I'm going to ask you the question and be honest with me. Have you... On that third hole with the big oak tree. Not a chance. I've never tried to fly at that over that tree. No, it's not the question. Have you sat on the tee box and said, see that oak tree? When I played here with John Daly, he took it over the oak tree. Probably every time I played. Of course. Now, if you're playing with a different ball than he is, he's not doing that. No, John. and, And you don't have that memory. And you don't have that comparison. That's that's the only question I'm asking, John. John, uh, uh, John Dale, John Daly, and I are probably never going to play golf again. Although I'd be happy to. That's number one. Number two, and more yeah. importantly, um, I'm smart enough, and golfers are smart enough to know that if you limited the the golf ball, the club for PGA Tour pros. It becomes a game of relevance. It becomes, does Tiger hit it as far as, as Rory? Does he hit it as far as DJ? Does he hit it as far as DeShambo? Et cetera, et cetera. And is one guy hitting a seven iron in? Is the other guy hitting a five iron in? It has nothing to do with me or you or John or, or Joe Schmo, the 16 handicap. There's no relevance there. We all get it. They're better. They hit it farther. They're bigger, they're stronger, they're faster, they're this, they're that, the other thing. 
just change the technology for the tour players and leave us old guys to knock it around, you know, 240, 250, 260. End of and story. So, What's yeah. wrong with that? So I'm going to tell you that this, this is a fascinating conversation. I, uh, I emphatically don't know which way we will end up in terms of the RNA and the USGA will guide us to. I'm convinced to the right answer. I have all the uh, time in the world for Martin Slumbers and Mike Davis. But I can tell you that this conversation will generate more opinions and more debate oh, I understand. Yeah. over the next couple of years than anything else in the game. Let and, me ask you two guys one more thing. Go ahead, finish yeah. though first. And Bryson is another reason that the conversation has heated up again. Yeah, but he shouldn't and, be he shouldn't be penalized for his body. That's and that that's part of it. That he should not be penalized for be. for for <laughs> his physical nature. No, but but hold on, that's all part of it though. If he hits it ten percent further than everybody else in the field, he's going to hit it. Still going to hit it ten percent. Yeah. So I, I I understand. Listen, there is there is um, uh, this this is there's a lot of research still to be done. There's a lot of analysis still to be yeah. done. Uh, it will be forensically studied and looked at. You've got two unbelievable uh, resources in the USGA and the RNA, but it will will definitely be an emotional debate over the next couple of years and the play and the players in the end keith with all due respect the players will win because they play the game and they'll be able to hit it as far as they can and and i mean you know that as well as i do player oh. players drive the storyline in the end play on the pro tour no, I'll players tell you who drives the storyline oh. is the dollars in their pockets and sure and, and but it, it all depends i mean like if, if they think a golf course is too hard they will not play it anymore and they're in, in well, that's not true it's a, unless it's a major unless, well, it's, unless, a major. It's, a, oh, unless okay. it's a major well we, and listen how many t how many players decided they wouldn't even come to canada because they didn't like glen abbey oh 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 there's 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 a lot of the players players outside of the majors outside of the incredible must plays yes. yeah they determine golf courses sure are very they do. much up there in sure terms they of, do you know, it, it, you know, they were whining about Wingfoot on Wednesday. They were whining about Wingfoot on Wednesday. Well, listen, some of okay. So we had this is an interesting story, and I won't tell you who it is. But but we oh, during our us. UK during our UK swing, we had six tournaments in the UK, and for the first five events, the top ten in the what we call the mini order of merit went to the U.S. Open. And midway through, one of the players who was a veteran was you know, doing very well in, uh, in the UK swing. And it looked like he was going to go to the U S open. And I said to him, so are you going to, are you going to, are you going to go? And my whole question was based on, you know, with, with COVID over there and the quarantine and the whole works, I didn't expect the answer coming back. He said, he goes, last time, last time I went to the U S open, it took me about three months to get my game back. Yeah. Because I was so demoralized after getting beaten up by the golf course for that long. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, it is a mental battle out there playing wing foot. And, you know, guys go over there because it's a major and, and, and you have to, you have to chase that dream because that certainly leads to the legacy of the game in terms of the majors. But uh, it, it, it is, it was punitive. And, and it's funny because everyone was thinking, oh, my goodness, Thursday they were doing well. And, you know, they got sub-air greens, which takes the moisture out. They firmed, they firmed it up a little bit. They tucked the pins. They had a little bit of wind and look out. Well, I can tell – I mean, I'm not going to try and analyze you two guys or anybody else that watches golf, but I watch a fair bit, as you guys know, and, and I know you do too. And, yes. I hope there he is, does. There is something – there is <laughs> – God, what a, Wait, what a, there is something uh, special about the majors a, a, and I get that. And they're always going to have the biggest audience because they're the majors. But I'll tell you, there have been many Sunday afternoons where I flipped on the television to watch the, whatchamacallit open. Yeah. And if they're 26 under par, I'm tuning, I'm, I'm going to click 
Yeah. But if it happens, if it happens to be, if somebody's five under or eight under or something like that, I'm going to watch it because I want to see these guys hit the shots that I hit. And I don't hit, I don't hit wedges into par fours uh, as a general rule. And I sure as hell don't hit wedges into par fives. And I'm not interested in watching a competition of who's closest to the hole with the wedge. Actually, yeah, and, it's interesting you say that, Bob, because th those, those regular types of tournaments, the only ones I will watch are the ones, the uh, courses that I played. And that's to Keith's point. Like, I'll watch every, every time they go to Riviera, I watch Riviera. When they go uh, to Torrey Pines, I, go, I, watch, I watch what happens at Torrey Pines. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. The, there, are, there are a couple, of, yeah, yeah, couple sure. of regular tournaments that I would watch just because, hey, uh, I, I hit my third shot there. He's at his drive. I hit my third shot there. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah. You know, and yeah. I, I four putted from there and, and yeah. he, he, he tanked it from eight feet, you know, so. Well, but you understand that all that does is confirm that you're not a very good player. Yeah, I know. Hey, can yeah. I, now, I, I want to ask some non golf questions. Can I, do uh, that? I, I knew you would. And we've, we, we, we've kept Keith a little long, but yeah, I know. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Not Fire away. Um, you obviously, you study where the world of, of media is going. Uh, the zone yeah. has become a factor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, during COVID, Netflix and Amazon Prime have become, you know, huge players for media. Where, where, do, where do you see sports? Where do you see, do you see a, a, a huge migration to, the, to, to web television in the future? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I see, I see. Yeah, I think you're seeing the slow erosion of linear television right in front of us. And, and if, 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 you are, if you are not... Uh, deeply thinking about as as a broadcaster uh, of of how you can you can be on multiple platforms and be where the younger generation is in different types of content and different uh, then then you'll fall behind. Mm -hmm. Like if you're if you you look at and you study television ratings, they are eroding in terms of on linear TV, and and so you best be thinking of a different way of, of distribution. And there is no doubt that people are consuming content and media way different than, than ever before. Let me ask you this one, though. We always oh. think that North America is ahead. Is, is, is North America ahead? Or, or, I mean, when you moved to Europe, did, you, did your eyes open up to see the technology, to see what they do? Because they have, there's a lot more jurisdictions. There's a lot more jurisdictions, a lot more countries. Yeah, it really, it really, it really depends on on what country. I think, to be honest with you, North America uh, uh, are are probably more robust in terms of the production levels of conventional and linear television. Uh, so they would be ahead of the of the rest of the world in terms of digital. Ooh, really depends on what country right. that you're at. Like, you know, uh, the Scandinavian countries and Viasat is very aggressive. Right. Um, they, the Germans they, too. I think the Germans are good. Germans are, Germans are really, really good. It really depends on, uh, on the different countries. But I'm telling you right now, linear, li the, fir the fundamental difference, John, is in America and in Canada, you know, you, you, you buy a, you buy a, you buy a house and you get a big TV and you, you know, in, in the U S you get ESPN and in, in Canada, you, you, you get a, uh, either Sportsnet or TSN. They come together. They always, everybody has them. Not the way over here, not the way over here. So the, the migration to digital and is, is far greater, but I, I, and, and this, this is my, my favorite story in that, you know, my boy, who is 17 now this was last year in uh i was i was coming back i think from spain and my wife and and daughter were out of town and i got home and and we go into the family room i got a 90 inch screen tv in in the family room and jason's in there it's about nine o'clock at night and he's there on his little laptop and the 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 screen is blank and i said jay just just curious at any time tonight <laughs> did you turn on the TV? And he looks at me like I've just asked him, like, why is he not running backwards 10 miles? Like it was, it was, he said, no. I said, 
Okay. That tells you everything you need to, you need to know. Uh, and you can learn everything from the younger generation, in my opinion, and the way that they consume content. They never, okay. they never watch on a single screen. Never. No, no. Well, the other thing is technology wise, I think the, the pandemic has, uh, has taught people that the purity of the quality of a picture isn't necessarily important anymore. You know, the perfect. Yeah. Picture. Yeah. Ab ab absolutely. Absolutely. But, but, but three things are happening. Everything's about globalization. Everything's about technology and people are living to a hundred. Right. So the people living to a hundred better learn the technology and better become wow. familiar with the global. And if they're living to a hundred, they can't hit it over the tree at, at Goodwood. So, um, Final question. We're halfway through. You, you know, you were part of the uh, the the, the earth-shattering, uh, game-changing twelve-year contract with Rogers in the National Hockey League. We're halfway through. Yeah. Six years. Yeah. Six yeah. years. Would you do it again? Oh, absolutely. If you did, if you didn't do it, Sportsnet wouldn't be where it is right now, and TSN would have taken all the television rights, and Sportsnet would have been almost non-existent. You would have lost all the sub fees regionally. So I don't know where they are from a financial perspective. I don't know any of that, but would you do it? You'd do it. Yeah. The only difference you might do is you might do an 18 year deal rather than a 12 year deal, but do it. Absolutely. And now the, it comes down to, and, and I, and I, I really don't follow it too much. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Jordan banks is very much digital uh, focused right. and no doubt, he is talking, no doubt he is talking exactly what we talked about mere moments ago is multiple distributions on different channels for the NHL. Because I never saw it as a linear television deal. I, I said when we were pre prepared to do it, you have to be prepared to take a game on Hockey Night in Canada and take it over the top. And at what year you will do that, I, maybe they do it now. But if pretty, pretty soon they'll be doing it. Well, the, the, the interesting thing. Not necessarily thing the it, main game. Not necessarily. No, the, no. no. But the, interesting th the interesting thing is that the, in many ways, the over-the-top product ends up being an out-of-market mar out product, and the, the league still controls a great deal part of that when you think about it. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting one because – uh, obviously, the numbers this year aren't aren't as good as they used to be because we're we're still you know we're 27 years without a Canadian team getting to the winning the Stanley Cup, and we're we, you know we're talking about a Stanley Cup final in September, uh, so it's a it's a little different. But w when you wonder about the ups and downs uh, that uh, that started when when you were here, whether it was worth doing again, it's a, it's an interesting question to ask. Hundred percent, not not even a. Hesitation, because okay. the, the, the reality is, which nobody talks about, is what would have transpired to Sportsnet and all of their distribution deals if they hadn't had the NHL. So you were, convi you were convinced this was the – TSA was, was going to can cannibalize everything. Yeah, absolutely. If, 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 because TSN was going to take that NHL deal 100%. They were, yeah. taking, they were taking all of it, which at that particular time – would have just spelled disaster for Sportsnet based on based on the current television ratings. So all of a sudden, you know, now when you talk to somebody at Sportsnet and they from their sales department and they talk to agencies, Sportsnet is the number one buy now, is the first buy because they because they they have the, the the best content in the summer and the winter. And listen, I was the president of TSN. I love TSN and uh, and. And but but I was working at Rogers at the time, and that was a that was a, a game changing deal for Sportsnet and for Rogers. Well, it was a game changing deal for John Shannon and I too, because uh, both of us. <laughs> well, that's why you don't are you doing po you're, yay? That's why we're doing a podcast instead of uh, you know. Oh, uh, that's not why we're doing a podcast, Bob. <laughs> we're doing a podcast because Keith Pelly's the youngest guy. <laughs> on this show that's why we're doing a podcast <laughs> hey I'm, I'm looking i'm looking forward to following your podcast now this is very very entertaining and it's good to, it's good it's good to do it's good to debate with bob and to hear your strong opinions again oh, well wow. i love it's that really. keith, keith it's not really but we we just <laughs> we, we we entertain them you know we allow them to do it ah uh, it yeah, is what yeah. it is <laughs> How is your game, my friend? 
Depends on the day, Pella. You know that. Yeah. Hey, listen, yesterday, yesterday was crap, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of here right now and see if I can uh, uh, have a good day today. Uh, you know we love you, and we miss you here. Um, uh, I assume you're not coming back anytime soon, but um, if you do, you damn well better call. I'll call, I'll call you, pal. I'll call All you as right. soon as I can get back. As soon as they lift the quarantine, I'm coming back. I hear you. I know you will. Okay. Uh, thank, thanks so much for all your time. We appreciate it. You guys are the best. Talk to you soon. Keith Kelly, the chief executive of the European Golf Tour. We'll see you next time on the podcast.